Alrighty. So, um, so Chris just brought up a good point. I wanted to talk to you about the midterm. Originally, we were going to have it um, on uh, October 31st, I believe. Um, but then we had the observation um, last time, and so that moved my schedule back by a day. So um, now we will have the midterm on um, the yeah November 2nd, I believe. So um, my plan is that today we'll talk about the circuit board um, or the, the schematic layout. Next time we'll talk about the circuit board layout, and then. Um, on um, Tuesday of next week, which will be Halloween, we will do a review for the midterm, and then Thursday of next week, a week from today, we will, or no, Thursday of next week, we will um, actually do the midterm. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be partially hands-on and partially um, online, written, multiple choice. So, yeah. There's a practice midterm that you can take on the Canvas website. Um, that'll prepare you for the online multiple choice portion. So you can start practicing with that if you'd like. And then um, I'll talk more about the hands-on portion uh, a little bit later. Okay. So other questions? Okay. So then let's get on and talk about some fun stuff. We're going to like I mentioned, today and um, on Thursday, we're going to go over the process of actually designing your own printed circuit boards. So the goal of all of this is to have files that you could use to actually make circuit boards. So I did this very process, and I came up with uh, some of these boards myself. So I'll pass these around. The boards come back from the fabricator looking just like this, with no components on. You have to solder on your own components. When they're done, they would look something like this. Okay, so I'll pass these around. Um, you guys can take a look at them. So that, the goal for this class is to create a design that you could use to actually make your own circuit boards. I'm not going to require that you make, that you actually send your designs out to be made, but if you come up with a design and you like it, I would highly recommend that that you do it and try it out and see how it comes out. Okay, so so the project that we're going to be doing is to make a small uh, trinket that has little flashing LEDs on it. So you'll design your circuit board to be a shape that that is fun for you. Um, you could make it a, a holiday shape. You could make it, you know, a Tie Fighter. You could make it. Um, anything that you want, right? Um, just something that would look cool with little blinking lights on. Okay, um, and then I will I will check your schematic that you designed today, and I'll check your circuit board that you uh, will actually lay out next time, um, and I'll I'll give you credit for doing those in the lab. You won't be graded on the board itself, but when you're done with those two labs, you will have you should have the files that you need to be able to send them off and get them printed. So like I said, if you get it to a point and, and you're excited about it, I, I would hope that some of you would actually send it out and um, and see how they turn out. The boards themselves are not that expensive. Um, there are various companies that will make them for you. The ones that, um, th this company that I used is called OSH Park, and they will make uh, a circuit board for um, five dollars per square inch, and that includes three copies of the board. Um, and so the the ones that I designed there, I think were um, something like four or five square inches. So it came out to be twenty five dollars for for three boards or something. So um, so it's not that expensive. And if you end up making a larger run, then you can get it even cheaper. And you can you can um, look at different companies out there that, that might even offer it for less money. So, um, so that's the idea. Any questions about that? Yeah. What was the turnaround time on, uh, on that? Uh, for for the 
ones that I got, it was about uh, two weeks from the time I sent it out to the time I had it in my hand. So yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. And again, other other companies can do it faster for a little bit more money. Uh, it just depends on what you're looking for. Okay. So that's the goal: is to to learn how to uh, design your own circuit boards. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. There are lots of different um, programs that you can use to design circuit boards. They go, they run the gamut. I mean, everything from, you know, very basic to, to extremely, extremely complicated, lots of features, lots of bells and whistles, uh, but very expensive, okay? So um, I had to pick one to teach you guys and the one I chose was dip tricks, and I chose that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is um, it has a lot of the features that that we're looking for. You can um, create a schematic, you can create a um, a circuit board layout, you can actually create your own parts. So um, they have a part library that includes most of the common things that you would use: resistors, capacitors. Uh, transistors, all that type of stuff. But sometimes you need to make your own. Um, for instance, I made a, a custom part for the uh, switch and for the uh, nine volt battery. So dip trace allows you to do that. Um, dip trace is um, free if you use fewer than 300 through holes in your uh, part. I think this one used in the neighborhood of, of 50 through holes. So we're well under that limit. So free is nice. Um, and this one was, was relatively um, intuitive to use, okay? Some of them, the more fancy ones, you know, have lots of bells and whistles, but they can have a little steeper learning curve. Um, so, so this one was, was not that uh, hard to get into. So for those reasons, I chose this one. But there are, there are many, many other choices out there. My hope is that I'll teach you a little bit about this one. It'll give you an introduction and some idea of what is out there. And then you guys can, um, can try that out and then can experiment with other ones um, on your own if you find that you have other things that you're looking for. Okay? So my idea is just to give you a flavor of what's available and show you that it's not that hard to do. It's not that expensive. Um, and, and give you guys that knowledge, okay? Any questions before we get going? Yeah. Back, back to the midterm for a second. Sure. Um, I'm looking at the online practice. Yeah. Um, it says a lot of attempts too. Is that your intention or? No, I'll, I'll have to fix that. You Thank should you. be able to take it as many times as you want. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, cool. So, let's find this up here. Um, can you hit the lights, someone, back by the uh, switch? Can you turn off the lights? Yeah, that looks good. Uh, They should be coming up here pretty soon. is we're going to launch dip trace. So if you go to the start menu and you type in dip trace, um, so, so you guys don't have to do this with me. My thought is that I would show you um, a little bit about it at first and show you how to put down a few components and do a few things and then I would let you uh, try it yourselves. Afterwards. You can follow along if you want, um, but you don't have to. Okay. So we go to dip trace launcher. And this brings up a screen that has um, 
four buttons on it. So these are sort of four different components or four different portions of the diff trace program. The one that we're going to be working with tonight is called schematic capture. This is the program that actually allows you to lay out a schematic. So the first step in creating a circuit board is to draw a schematic diagram, almost like, very much like the ones that you have seen and, and been doing in the rest of your, uh, your electronics training. So that's what we're going to be working with tonight. PCB layout is the one that we're going to work with next time. This takes the schematic that you've already created and it turns it into a board. So this is the, the PCB layout is where you decide, decide exactly where all of the components are going to fit on your board and um, arrange them. Okay? The component editor and the pattern editor are used for creating your own components. So we won't be doing those in this class, but that's something that that's another feature that is included <coughs> with DipTrace. Okay. So we're going to go to schematic capture. Um, now, sometimes when or when you when you first pull up DipTrace and run it for the first time, like will be happening on many of your computers, it will come up with a a little window that asks you um, to select your graphics mode. You can choose. Direct 3D, I don't think it matters much. And then um, you can choose uh, whatever type of background color you want. I think um, you can choose a white or a black background. Anyway, when, when you end up opening the screen, you're going to see a window that looks like this. Okay? You'll have a blank area in the middle, which is where most of your components are going to go. And then you have a list of components on the left-hand side that you can choose from. Okay. So the first thing that you're going to do in your lab is you're going to come up with a design that you want to use for your um, circuit. And then after you do that, um, you can start putting down the components that you're going to need onto your circuit diagram. Okay, so I think I have a list of the components in the lab. Um, so most of the components are here under the components library in the discrete section. So for instance, um, you want to choose an LED. So you'll just come down here to the menu and you'll find LED. And you'll grab that and you can put down, you just click as many times as you want and put lots of copies of LEDs down, okay? When you're done, you can hit escape and, and stop putting them down. Um, then it talks about um, choosing the res 500. These are resistors. So you, you come to this part down here and pick res 500. Put a couple of those down, hit escape again. So you're just going to do this and you're going to go through um, all the components that you need to build your circuit. Um, when you're when you're done, the circuit should look like this. Okay, so so you're going to need all of the components that are are in this circuit. Um, one component which is a little bit harder to find is this one in the middle. It says U2. This is a, a 555 timer chip. Okay, so um, this is a chip that is specifically designed to create square wave outputs. So <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use this chip to create a square wave. And that square wave is going to power our LEDs. Okay. So when the, the square wave output is high, the LEDs are going to be on. When the square wave output is low, the LEDs are going to be off. All right? So, uh, so we can, the, the timing of the 555 chip is determined by the choice of this resistor and this capacitor, R1 and C2, okay? Um, 
basically what happens is that um, current flows into R1 and it charges up C2. And then when C2 gets to a certain level, it flips the output and then current starts flowing out of uh, C2 through R1. Okay, So current flows in, it triggers, and then current starts flowing out. And when the voltage gets low enough, it triggers the chip again. And then it, it uh, flips around and starts charging the capacitor up again. So the combination of R1 and C2 determine how long it takes for the capacitor to fill up and discharge. And that determines how long it takes for the uh, to turn the LEDs on and off. Okay, So I've chosen R1 and C2 for you in such a way that the LEDs will be on for about half a second and off for about half a second. Okay, so that should be a fairly decent blink rate. Okay, but that's that's what's going on with those two components. Some of you may have played around with um, 555 timers in ET302. Anybody do the 555 timer lab? A couple people. All right, so um, you may be familiar with it there, but if you're not, that basically a, that was a short explanation of what is happening with this chip, okay? So it's getting power from the uh, battery over here. Um, we are filling up and discharging this capacitor, and that sets the timing for making these LEDs go on and off, okay? So in order to find the 555 timer chip, um, we have to use this this filter function of the schematic program here. So this is like a search function. Okay, so if you click on filter, um, you can uh, look for. You, you can change the the library to the component group, and then you can look for. Um, 555. Now, if you just type in 555, it's going to bring up a whole lot of components. There's a lot of components that have 555 in them, in their name. Um, so this shows different variations of the 555 timer. Some of them are surface mount, some of them are um, standard mount, and it shows some other things too. So we need to get a little bit more specific than that. So I believe that I listed in your lab exactly what you should search for. You should look for LM555CJ. Okay? And when you do this, I believe that it comes up with only one component. Yeah. So then you can click on this one and pop it down on your diagram. And then that is uh, the 555 timer that you're going to need. And then you can cancel the filter and get rid of that. So you've got your, your 555 timer there. Now, so, so you can go through that process and plop down most of the components that you need for this circuit. There are a few things on here which are special, OK? Um, like I said, I used the the features of the uh, program that allow you to create your own custom component so that we could have our own 9-volt uh, battery holder and our own uh, switch. Okay? So we need to add these libraries to our program. So what you're going to do is you have to copy some files. Okay, so um, so you have to find the libraries folder for dip trace. You're going to go to uh, documents, and then dip trace, and then my libraries. And that's where you're going to put these libraries. You're going to get them from the instructor files. So you're going to get them from um, Meyer J. That's my folder. 
and ET322 dip trace libraries. So you're going to copy these over to the My Libraries folder for dip trace. I believe that I listed both of those file paths in the lab, so hopefully you will have that information. And then you need to tell dip trace about these libraries, okay? So to do that, um, you're going to go to, um, you click on this bar up here where it says components, and then you go to library setup. And then um, user components, and then you're gonna say add library. that library and say OK. And then when you've done that, you should be able to go to user components and find Jordan's component library. Okay. And from this new library that you've just added, um, you're going to choose the 9-volt battery pack perpendicular and then also the 0.1-inch um, pitch switch. So now you guys know how to add the components that you're going to use, okay? Any questions about that part so far? I know we've gone through it kind of fast, but um, any questions so far? Yeah. Can you go to the libraries part again? Yeah. Through yeah. Library. That was kind of fast. So. <clears throat> We have a video on the YouTube video, right? <laughs> there, there will be a YouTube video, but it won't be up tonight. So for, for all of you who uh, came out in person, which I really appreciate, um, let's go through that one more time. So, so we need to add some custom libraries to Diptrix. The, you're going to get those custom libraries by going to Instructor Files, Meyer J, ET322, and looking in the DipTrace Libraries folder. Okay, so that's where the libraries are going to come from. You're going to put them into the folder that's uh, under Documents, DipTrace, My Libraries. Okay, so you're going to Initially, the DipTrace Libraries folder will be empty. You're going to go over to the Instructor Files folder and copy the two libraries from there into the DipTrace Library folder. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I believe that the yeah I, I have listed out the directories. Um, where you're going to copy the files from and when they're going to go to um, on the lab sheet. So you should be able to pull those up on the lab sheet, or by, by looking at the lab sheet. Um, and then once you have gotten those, you have to tell DipTrace about them. So to tell DipTrace about the library, you click up here on user components and then you click on library setup. And you click on um, user components and you say add library and you choose um, the library that you just added. Okay. Um, so that's the general procedure. If anybody got hung up, I'd be happy to come around uh, later and, and show you guys exactly how to do that. But that's the general procedure. Okay. So let's talk briefly about how we can actually wire components together. Okay. So it's not enough to have the components on your diagram. Of course, you need to tell the program how those components are actually connected. And for the most part, um, well, the first thing you want to do is you want to get them in sort of the right general area. So you can 
just click on the component and drag it to move it where you want it to be. And then um, you can also um, rotate it. Okay, so you can either right click on it and say um, rotate, or you can hit the R key on your keyboard, and that will rotate the component as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to do that here for a couple of these diodes. And then you can move them into generally the right place. And then to connect them, you just click on the terminal of one component, and then it starts drawing a line, and then you click on the terminal of the next component to connect them together. So it's um, it's it's pretty similar to multi-sim that you guys um, have been have have used in ET302. Okay, so um, you you connect the components together like that. So once you have the components, you will just wire them together like it shows in the circuit diagram there. You can connect. Um, once you are done wiring together and you want to start moving things around again, you can use the escape key, and that will let you start moving things around again. Okay, so you can go back and forth between moving things around and uh, wiring. There is, um, there is one special type of wiring that I want to point out. So you'll notice on your lab, um, that you have this one pin here, v, uh, number th three, that says out, and it looks like there's just a wire hanging out in space, right? It's not. It doesn't look like it's connected to anything, but it does have this little label on there. So um, if we uh, zoom in we can see that the little label says V out. Now, if we look at the top of um, the, the diodes here, we see another little label that says V out. So <coughs> what this means is that these two pins are connected to each other. Even though there's no line on the diagram, these two pins are connected. It's as if there's a line on the diagram. Um, but if we were to put a line on the diagram, it would be crossing this other line, and it would be sort of cluttered, and it might not be clear whether this line was uh, attached to this, this wire up here or not. So, um, so instead of having a, a wire going from here over to here, um, we just label the pins the same thing, and that allows for a connection between these two places. And this is a common practice in schematic diagrams. Um, oftentimes, these labels are used when pieces are, are uh, separated by a long distance, either, either on one page or for large schematics, you can have a diagram that spans two or more pages. Okay? And of course, it would be impossible to draw a wire from one page to the next. So. When, when you're making or indicating connections from a component on one page to a component on another page, that's done using this, uh, this labeling technique. Okay, so this is something that is a common practice in industry. So you'll need to use this if you are designing your own circuits or if you're trying to read somebody else's circuit diagram. Okay, so this label, the same label means that the two places are connected. So let's talk about how we can actually create those labels. The proper name for those labels is a net, so or a net name. So to change the net name for a particular wire, you can right click on that wire and click this name, the current name, at the top of the menu. So right now the name is net3. That was just an arbitrary name that was given to this wire. It's not very descriptive. So we're going to change that name. This is the 
output voltage from this chip. So we're going to name this wire V out. Okay. And you can say okay. Now you'll notice that we changed the name, but the label doesn't show up. So if we right click, we can see that the name is now V out like we want, but there's no indication on the diagram of what it is. So we want to show that on the diagram. So to display that, you, you choose this next option down that says display name. Okay. So now we have changed the name and we are displaying it on our circuit. If you want to zoom in and zoom out on the circuit, you can roll the scroll wheel on your mouse. Okay. Um, so we've named this wire, but now we want to connect it up to the top of our um, of our LED. So we'll create another wire up there, and we can do the same thing up here. We right click on there, we change this name, and we'll type the same name that we used before up here. B out. It's important that the name is exactly the same. Same capitalization, same everything. Okay, so that the computer knows that we're talking about the same thing. So we'll change the name, we'll say okay, and now it pops up with this dialogue. It says, net with such name already exists. Do you want to continue and connect by name? So that's exactly what we want to do. It's telling us that we already have a wire with that name, and if we proceed, we're going to make a connection to this existing wire. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, if you if you were not intending to do that and this dialogue popped up, you'd have to go and, and see what went wrong. But that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So we'll say yes. Again, we've changed the name, but the dis the, it's not shown anywhere on the screen. So we'll click on display name to make it show up up there. Okay. So now we've connected this wire up here to this wire down there. And when you roll over one of them, they both highlight in uh, light blue. So you can see that connection. Okay. All right. So in my circuit, I did that with the V out. And I also did that with the C voltage here. Okay, this is the control voltage. I connected pin five control voltage to the top of this capacitor down here, um, control voltage. I thought that if I had the wire going straight from pin 5 down here, it would be unclear whether it was or was not connected to this other wire. So I, I connected them by name instead. Okay, So you'll do that trick uh, for the control voltage and also for the output voltage. Um, now, you'll notice that in my diagram on, on the lab, we have the values of the components listed, 68 kilo ohms, 10 microfarads, and 0.01 microfarads. It's very important to specify what size of the component you want to use, because obviously if you, if you put the wrong resistor size in a circuit, um, it's not the circuit's not going to behave the way you want it to. So let's talk about how you can actually um, specify the values of these resistors or other components. The way you do that is you right click on the component and you go to properties at the bottom. Okay. So now the properties um, specify a lot of things. Um, there's a name, but there's a value space which is blank right now. So if we wanted to fill that in, we just type in what we want, 68K. Now, ideally, we would type in 68K, and then we'd use that little omega symbol, right, that, that stands for ohms. But this program does not support that symbol. Um, so instead, we can use another uh, trick which is often used in the industry. Instead of using the omega symbol, we just use a capital R. Okay, so that, that is also an abbreviation for ohms. So we'll say 68KR. Now, that's the value, um, but it's not showing up here. So, um, 
let's see. So so the main marking um, is the default. We can choose the additional marking um, to be the value. And then if we do that, the value shows up underneath the part. Okay. So we have the, the name and the value of our part. And you can do that for the capacitors that you're going to use as well. Okay. Yeah, so one more time. The way that you specify the value is you right click on the component, you uh, go to properties, and then you go and you set the value. So say 100 R here. And then you can go to markings, and for the additional marking, we can choose value. And then that should make it show up. Okay? Now, you'll notice that on this circuit, I've put R2 down here, but I did not specify a value. Okay? You guys are going to have to come up with your own value to use for R2. All right? um, the reason for that is that I don't know how many LEDs you're going to use in your design. Right? Um, I think that they should be in multiples of four because the LEDs take about one and a half or two volts each. So if you had two volts each, um, that would be eight volts there, and you're getting a, a supply of nine volts, so that would leave just about one volt across your resistor. Um, and then, depending on how many sets of these four LEDs you have, that will determine what size of a resistor you're going to use. Okay. Let me let me give you an example. Um, suppose we have it done just the way that I have listed here in my uh, diagram. So we've got two strings of LEDs. Each string has four in it. Um, and we know that each string wants uh, 20 milliamps flowing through. Okay, 20 milliamps is about what you want in order to light up your LEDs. So we know that we have, we're going to have a total of about 40 milliamps flowing through this resistor, right? And we know that we want to have about one volt across this resistor. So now we know current and voltage, right? We can use those two things to calculate the size of the resistor that we need. So um, resistance equals voltage over current. So um, that would be 1 over 40 milliamps. So um, 1 divided by 0.04. So we would want a 25 ohm resistor. Then. Okay. You guys can do a similar calculation. Um, depending on whether you have a um, whether you have a you know one string of LEDs or two or three or however many you want, you can use that to figure out how much um, how much resistance you need down at the bottom. Okay. Uh, so. Any questions about that so far? I know I'm going kind of fast, but um, that's that's the general idea. Any questions so far? Yeah. I don't know this question. If we not, uh, we should order our own board to somewhere. Or? So, if you are done and you you are happy with your design, then yes, by all means, feel free to to order. Um, I'll talk about how, what you would need to do um, next class and, and um, how you could go about that. 
Um, it's not a requirement for this class, but yeah, if you like it uh, and you want to see how it comes out, then please, by all means. Yeah, question. Is this going to give us a 50% duty cycle? Yes. Yes. Um, so if you if you want to play around with the um, 555 timer circuit, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, you can just Google 555 timer circuits and there are equations for how you can choose um, the resistor and capacitor to give you different timings um, and different duty cycles. You could add in, you would have to add in a, another resistor if you were going to change from a 50% duty cycle. Um, but but you can do that. You're, you're more than welcome to try that out if that suits your fancy. Um, it's just up to you guys. Okay. So um, the last thing that I wanted to point out was about the capacitors. So I list two capacitors that you're going to use. Um, and they're, they're different. And it's an important distinction, but they look very similar on the screen. Okay, So one of them is bigger. It's this 10 microfarad. And this one is polarized. The other one is smaller. It's 0.01 microfarads, and it's not polarized. Now, both of these capacitors have the little curved side, which we have been using to mean a polarized capacitor. So they both look like they're polarized. But this program uses a slightly different convention. This program indicates polarized capacitors using this little plus sign. Okay? So all capacitors in this program have the curved side on, on one side. The polarized capacitors have a plus sign. The non-polarized capacitors do not have that plus sign. Okay? So this is a large capacitor. It has a, a circular footprint um, like we use for the um, electrolytic polarized capacitors. And so it's important that you use that one as the, the larger capacitor. This one is a non-polarized capacitor. It has a rectangular footprint. And so it's important that you use this one for the non-polarized smaller capacitor. Okay. Um, so I think that that was um, everything that I wanted to say about this program. Does anybody have questions? Yeah. So when you uh, when you were the boards, yeah, and you have like holes drilled in them, yes, like mounting holes, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I can I can tell you about that. You would probably have to make your own component to do that. So it would be like a mounting component or something like that. But I can show you how to do that. It's not too hard. Um, so yeah, yeah, you can, like I said, we're not really going to go into creating your own components as, as a class as a whole, because um, that's a slightly more advanced topic. But it's really not too hard. Um, and it's. Um, it's definitely something that you would do if you went out and started doing this um, on a regular basis. So, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Then I am going to um, take roll, and then I'll turn it over, and you guys can start working on this on your own. You can turn the lights back on, so it goes to sleep. Thank you. In the very beginning, it said go to start. Jordan, so if I wanted to say, uh, put maybe like a photo session on it, so someone gets closer, yeah, and have it light up. Yeah. The, yeah. If we're, if we're looking at this, this type of right timer won't necessarily be able to do something like that. I know with an op amp you can just put into the feedback uh, portion of this. Right. Um, so you might use something like imperative for that. Um, so yeah, let me tell you about that.
Ahmed I did. Abdu Shukar Limpala. Yeah. Richard Axley. Yeah. Daniel Conner. Yeah. Christopher Connor. Yeah. Alexander Dushenko. Here. Rachel Freud. Here. Crispin Gomez. Here. Abel Goodsell. Here. Jordan Hodges. Here. Cross it out. Maddie Jamel. Here. Richard Meebach. Just here. Here. Christopher Mitchell. Here. Belayed McCotter. Here. Alexander Nitsetayev. Here. John Pierce. Here. Ashley Perment. Here. Ilya Popov. Here. Ariel Grokson-Tisteva. Here. Rafael Silva. Here. Nicholas Stinson. Here. Ryan Tsai. Here. Corey Tavares. Here. And Philip Weechek. Oh, I don't know if he's going to see this. Anyway. Um, OK. You guys are, are welcome to start designing on your own. So oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying? So, if I were to, if I wanted to add like a photo resistor to this, yeah, mm -hmm. I can add the photo resistor. But where would on this particular chip is there? Uh, is there one that I can connect to that old? So, um, what I would do is I would put it in series with your power there, so that um, so it all act like a switch. Yeah, exactly. I mean that that sounds like what you're looking for, right? When somebody gets close, it turns on. When somebody goes farther away, it turns off. Is that yeah. what you're thinking of? Um, yeah, so um, I would um, probably use a photo resistor in combination with uh, a comparator. So what is a comparator? Just distance? Um, so so a comparator looks at two voltages, and then it will um, it will flip a switch if one voltage is higher than the other. So basically, you um, similar to like ne negative feedback. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, if you if you um, have a shadow come across the well. Okay, so let's let's sketch it out. Um, it might be worth actually prototyping it on a, a breadboard to see if it works before you open into reserve. So the way that the comparators work is they look like an op amp, um, and they. Yeah, they, they compare these two um, voltages at, at the inputs, um, and they've got power and ground. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, if if this input is higher than um, this one, then the output is high. If this input is lower, then the output is low. Basically. If the positive input is high, the output is high. If the negative input is high, the output is low. And one way of thinking of it is on or off. Yeah, exactly. It's like a little it's like a little switch here that either connects the output to ground or does not. Okay, so um, so if you had your um, yeah, or or your um, your battery, your yeah, essentially your your uh, well, your battery would be here like this, and then um, your your LEDs could be up here, and then the resistor could be here, and then that could be going to your your. Um, here it is here. Um, and yeah, so basically you would have a, a voltage divider here. Um, scroll down that's pick your LED So so this would be at you know like 
torque and a half volts most of the time. And then the other side would be um, your, your photo sensor. So this would be essentially the resistor which is light sensitive and then that goes to ground. So when when you change the amount of light that's hitting this thing, it changes the resistance here, so that changes the voltage here, and it can either go above or below this, this set point. And um, when it goes one way, this connection is closed, and the lights can turn on. Where do you this So this connects over to the, the rest of your, your 555 chip. So, so this would connect to pin whatever is, three, I think, output of the five 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 time. So you would, um, yeah, you'd basically have all of this the same, and then you would insert the little um, uh, comparator output connected to the bottom of R2. So that would either provide a path to ground or not. So that way they'll either be on or off. Well, they would, yeah, they would either be allowed to blink or not. All right, I see. And then let, let's say, suppose I want these to be on. Like uh -huh. let's say these are all green and these are all red. Uh -huh. So if there's no one here, it's, so if, so I can just separate, I could put another resistor here, separate this from here, and then have, so, so in a sense what I'm thinking of is <coughs> you've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If someone's nearby, these are green, mm -hmm. they're red. Mm -hmm. If someone's nearby, then it'll be red, like don't go. If no one's there, it'll be green. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gotcha. Um, yeah, okay, so then, yeah, so you wouldn't even need the, the 555 timer for that. You would just want the, the lights to be either on or, or red or green, right? Yeah. Or yeah. I guess I can make it like a stoplight. There would be a, a red, a green, and a yellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yeah, you could, you could try that. Um, so then what would, what would determine which lights were on. Which is which is what I'm thinking is, do I put two comparators maybe? I put two comparators in the parallel? Oh, I see what you're saying. So, yeah, you could do something like that. Um, so, yeah, you could have, right, you could have this go even further and uh, have another uh, resistor down there and then you could have another comparator over there. Um, so this voltage could be going in there and then this one uh, Hopping over and there. So, so if this voltage was, you know, well, this one, then, then that would turn on. If it was even lower, then then this one would turn on. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's an idea. I would definitely uh, prototype this before you put it into the the board, though. Yeah. So you can you can play around with this. We have comparators. We have LEDs. You can you can try it out. Okay. Yeah. I guess do that to mess around with people or just make a stop light. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Real quick question. Yeah. Do the voltage across the LEDs? Are they within some volts? Um. So we have various LEDs here. Okay. Um, we have yellow ones, green ones, they're all a little bit different. So I would actually measure it with a meter and figure it out. So, um, so we have 